uh, the Belgian Confession, page 855 in the back of your hymn book. I want to spend a few weeks with you focusing on the character of God. Learning of the character of God is something that cannot be exhausted in a lifetime. It's something that cannot even be exhausted in eternity. Forever and ever, we will continue to have new and fresh knowledge of the character of God. So the things that we'll be studying today and for the next few weeks only touch the surface. The more we interact with God's revelation of Himself in sacred Scripture, the more we realize how little we know about Him. He's so glorious and so majestic and so highly exalted above us that we can only begin in a very limited way to understand who He is. It is our privilege as Christians to study what God has revealed about Himself. Article 1 of the Belgian Confession declares that there's only one God. And then it goes on to list some of the attributes of God. Attributes are characteristics of God revealed to man. And we hope to look at some of these in the coming weeks. May the Lord give us understanding as we do so. And may it drive us to humble and joyful worship. As noted in the bulletin, it is not enough for the Christian to know that God is. We must be driven by a holy passion to know who He is. The pursuit of the knowledge of God must never be undertaken as a casual exercise. It must be the chief business of our lives. Article 1, the only God. We all believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that there is a single and simple spiritual being whom we call God, eternal, incomprehensible, invisible, unchangeable, infinite, almighty, completely wise, just, and good, and the overflowing source of all good. Let's open our Bibles to Psalm 135. Psalm 135. I'm going to read the whole psalm. We're going to focus on verses 6 through 12 as we consider His sovereignty. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise Him, O you servants of the Lord, you who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his special treasure. For I know that the Lord is great, and our Lord is above all gods. Verse 6, whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and in earth, in the seas. And in all deep places, he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. He destroyed the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into the midst of you, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all his servants. He defeated many nations and slew mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to Israel, his people. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your fame, O Lord, throughout all generations. For the Lord will judge his people, and he will have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them are like them, so is everyone who trusts in them. Bless the Lord, O house of Israel. Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. Bless the Lord, O house of Levi. You who fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion, who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. So far the reading of his holy word.
What's the greatest subject that can occupy the mind of a Christian? What's the most satisfying, comforting, challenging, and the most mind-exercising of subjects? A preacher of the 1800s said, nothing will so enlarge the intellect, nothing so magnify the whole soul of man as a devout, earnest, continued investigation of the great subject of the deity. Would you lose your sorrow? Would you drown your cares? Then go, plunge yourself in the Godhead's deepest sea. Be lost in his immensity, and you shall come forth as from a couch of rest, refreshed and invigorated. What's the greatest subject that can occupy the mind of a Christian? The study of God. When we study the character and attributes of God, we are both humbled and enriched. The prophet Jeremiah said, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. The Lord said through Jeremiah, glory in your understanding and knowledge of me. That means that we should fill our minds with a knowledge of God. Such knowledge will produce godliness and joy. Today, as we begin a brief study of the character of God, we want to focus on His sovereignty. His sovereignty. What do we mean when we speak of the sovereignty of God? The sovereignty of God is His absolute rule and authority over the universe, His undisputed right to govern all that He has created. He's on the throne of the universe, directing everything according to His own good pleasure. He has absolute control over every creature. There is nothing in the universe that can take place outside of His sovereign control. Brothers and sisters, the sovereignty of God is asserted throughout the pages of Holy Scripture. If you were to go through the Word of God, compiling a list of verses on on the subject, you would have a very lengthy list. Well, today we want to ponder the words of the psalmist in Psalm 135, verses 6 through 12, where the psalmist declared, number one, his rule over nature. Number two, his rule over life. Number three, his rule over adversity. And number four, his rule over the nations. Deism. Deism of the 18th century said that God's relation to this world is like that of a watchmaker to a watch. A watchmaker makes a watch, winds it up, and then lets it run on its own. In the same way, it was said, God made this world and then let it go according to the laws of nature. He observes his creation from the outside and really has nothing more to do with it. But brothers and sisters, this view is contrary to the teaching of God's word. Jesus said that not even a sparrow can fall to the ground apart from the will of the Father, Matthew 10, 29. God is much more than a spectator of human events. He's in direct control of all that takes place within his creation. Paul said it is in him that we live and move and have our being. He rules his creation with absolute sovereignty and authority. Do we really believe that? It's one thing to say that God is able to see into the future... But it's another thing to say that God actually makes things happen. And that from the smallest to the greatest events in human history, God governs all that comes to pass. Nothing ever takes place outside the scope of His sovereign providential government. Yes, even those brutally painful, heart-rending things. The definition of providence in our catechism is amazing. All things, yes, 
All things come to us not by chance, but from His fatherly hand. We don't understand it all. We're not able to explain it all. Nevertheless, we believe it because God's Word teaches it. God has not abandoned the world that He created, but He rules and governs it according to His holy will. Nothing happens without His appointment. Congregation, in Psalm 135, the psalmist declared that Yahweh is the only God and His greatness is seen in the things that He does. Consider, first of all, number one, His rule over nature. Look with me in your Bibles to verse 6. Whatever the Lord pleases, He does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all deep places. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of His treasuries, His storehouses. In poetic language, the psalmist describes how all things are guided by the sovereignty of God. The Lord does whatever He pleases, verse 6. He does not seek permission from anyone or consult with anyone. His mighty deeds are seen in four areas, verse 6. Heaven, earth, sea, and the deep places. In other words, God's sovereign rule is established wherever you look, wherever you go, and wherever you're not able to go. Now, we know from Scripture that God exercises His rule over the invisible world, the spirit world. The angels bow before Him and rejoice in doing His will. The demons, although they hate God, are still subject to Him and can only operate within the boundaries that He has set for them. In fact, Satan and his demons could not even exist for a moment if God did not sustain them in their existence by the word of His power. Nehemiah 9 verse 6 says, You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, and you preserve them all. But God exercises His rule not only in the invisible world, but also in the world that we observe. Verse 6 says, whatever the Lord pleases, He does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all deep places. Verse 7 goes on to offer some examples of the power of God in creation. The psalmist says, He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. The process of evaporation that most of us take for granted is under God's direct control. It goes unnoticed by most of us because we are accustomed to it. But when we pause to ponder how God causes the vapors to ascend, it should give us reason to marvel at His greatness. We tend to explain the water cycle scientifically, don't we? The heat from the sun evaporates tons of water each day from oceans, lakes, rivers, and ponds. As the warm, moist air rises, it begins to cool. The cooling causes clouds to form. When these clouds meet colder air, rain or some other form of precipitation falls to the earth, where evaporation begins all over again. The sun evaporates the water and the cycle repeats itself. Scientists are able to study the water cycle and explain the whole process in technical language. But what many of them fail to acknowledge is that God sovereignly controls it. God causes the heat from the sun to evaporate tons of water each day. God causes it to form into clouds. God causes the clouds to water the earth. And God causes the cycle to repeat itself. The earth and the air are constantly exchanging water with each other. The water cycle works perfectly and continuously. It is vital to sustain life on earth. Without the water cycle, we could not survive. All of this is under the sovereign rule of God. It's not regulated by some impersonal force. It is regulated by the good pleasure and wise decision and direction of God. The next time you look over a lake in the early morning hours 
and you see the mist rising from the water, remember, God is doing it. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. It doesn't happen by chance, but by His appointment. The water cycle is a testimony to the greatness of God as He upholds all things by the word of His power. Brothers and sisters, a vivid illustration of God's authority over the water cycle is found in the important, that important episode in the life of the prophet Elijah. You children remember that story? Because of the apostasy of King Ahab and the nation of Israel, God punished them by interrupting the water cycle. Elijah said that it would not rain except by God's word, and it did not rain for three and a half years. The land was struck by a severe drought. Then, after the Mount Carmel victory where the prophets of Baal were humiliated, Elijah prayed that God would restore the rain, and it was restored. Children, who stopped the water cycle? God did. Who caused the clouds to reappear after three and a half years? And who caused the heavy rains to fall? God did. Do not think, congregation, that the food on your table is merely the result of advanced technology. God causes the vapors to ascend, the clouds to form, and the rain to fall so that the crops can grow and the food can be placed on your table. And then verse 7 mentions not only the water cycle, but also what? The lightning. The lightning. Verse 7b says, He makes lightning for the rain. Lightning can be an awesome spectacle. Have you ever stood outside on your front porch in the darkness of the night and watched these amazing streaks of lightning light up the sky, an incredible display? I think most of us have experienced those occasions when the sky is lit up by bolts of lightning. Most of us have seen the effects of lightning in a massive maple tree that is torn to shreds or in a barn that is burned down. A number of years ago, not far from where we lived, a young man was struck and killed by lightning during the opening game of a baseball championship. Lightning is incredibly powerful. It is amazing to watch, and its effects are remarkable. Scientists are still unsure concerning many, many of the facts about lightning. We are told that it is caused by an electrical current. It can jump from cloud to cloud or from a cloud to the ground. When the electricity jumps from the cloud through the air, you see lightning. The lightning heats the air, and when this hot air bumps into the cold air, you hear thunder. Did you hear it this morning? It is estimated that every day there are 45,000 thunderstorms in the world. That means that there are some 1,800 thunderstorms for each hour of the day. Does it happen by chance? Does it happen in an impersonal, mechanical way? When a young baseball player died from lightning, one of the coaches called the accident a freak of nature. A freak of nature. Was it a freak of nature? No, congregation. Our text says God makes the lightning. He makes it, controls it, directs it. Every lightning bolt is under His command. Furthermore, verse 7 mentions not only the water cycle and the lightning, but also the wind. He brings forth the wind from his storehouses. Wind can also be a very powerful force. When the sun warms the air, it becomes lighter. The warm air rises, and the colder air rushes into the area where the warm air had been. This action goes on in a continuous cycle so that the air is in constant motion. When the wind becomes exceptionally strong, it can do extensive damage. We were reminded of that last weekend as some of the members of the congregation in PEI told us about the astonishing power of Hurricane Fiona. 
When Fiona made landfall in the Atlantic provinces on September 24, 2022, it was the strongest, one of the strongest storms in Canadian history. On Prince Edward Island, the fierce winds knocked down millions of trees and the crashing waves eroded hundreds of kilometers of shoreline. The island experienced widespread and substantial damage. Do such things happen by chance? Do they happen in an impersonal, mechanical way? Certainly not. God brings the wind out of his storehouses. When you see the trees bending in the wind, when you hear the howling of a storm, when you see the ripples on the lake from the wind, you can be assured that it is under the supreme and careful government of the Lord. When your children come out of bed during a loud thunderstorm or windstorm and are afraid, we can explain to them that God makes the lightning, the rain, and the wind. People can talk about the laws of nature and the discoveries of modern science, but the bottom line is really this, Hebrews 11, verse 3, God upholds all things by the word of his power. Well, secondly, our text speaks not only of his sovereignty over nature, but also his sovereignty over life. His sovereignty over life. Look at verse 8. He destroyed the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. See, God not only controls the rain, lightning, and wind, but he controls the lifespan of each individual. In verse 8, the psalmist recalled the power of God that was displayed in Egypt prior to the exodus. You recall how Pharaoh hardened his heart to the word of the Lord and refused to let the Israelites go. He was repeatedly warned and he repeatedly scorned the admonition. His heart was like granite. Finally, When the Israelites were in their homes, shielded by the blood of the doorposts and lintels, it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. When Pharaoh rose in the night, there was a great cry, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Think about it, brothers and sisters. All the burials in the land of Egypt, funeral after funeral. There was not a family in Egypt that was not grieving. Every home had a weeping mother mourning the loss of a son and a grieving father trying to cope with the loss of a firstborn. How the nation cried out in anguish. Now, congregation, the question could be asked, did God do this? Did he bring such misery on the land? Did he kill all those people and animals? Is this the action of a loving God? Listen to Deuteronomy 32, verse 39. There is no God besides me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. We may not always understand why there are so many casualties throughout the world, but we do know that God rules over life and death. When he says life, it is life. When he says death, it is death. God is not unjust or unfair. We read in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 6, The Lord kills and the Lord makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. Do we understand why so many people around the world die in such a horrible way? Do we understand the school shootings in which numerous children or young people perish, or the college or church shootings in which people die or are injured? I don't understand it, but I do know from Scripture, without excusing the sinfulness of the perpetrators, without excusing the sinfulness of the perpetrators, I know from Scripture that nothing happens in this world without God's appointment. 
He's not the author of sin, and he cannot be charged with the sins which are committed, but God does govern the universe, and he rules over life and death. Dear people, there are no accidents. Every fatal collision, every phone call in the middle of the night, and every unexpected funeral has been sent to us by God who plans all things. And for us who are his children, we may rest assured that in Christ he loves us more than we know. Yes, he loves us more than we know. Thirdly, we also see from our text that God is sovereign over adversity. He's sovereign over nature. He's sovereign over life. And he also rules over adversity, calamities. Go to verse 9. Verse 9. He sent signs and wonders into the midst of you, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all his servants. Again, the psalmist recalled the power of God that was displayed in Egypt prior to the Exodus. Because Pharaoh hardened his heart, the water was turned to blood. Frogs covered the land and then died so that the land stank. Lice covered man and beast. Thick swarms of flies were everywhere. The livestock were diseased. Boils broke out on man and beast. Hail mingled with fire destroyed crops, man and animals, and locusts darkened the sky and ate all vegetation. And then thick darkness, darkness which could be felt, came over the land for three days so that no one could rise from his place. Children, who destroyed the land of Egypt? Who made it a wasteland? God did. We read in Amos 3, verse 6, If there is calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? If there is calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? Yes, congregation, calamity is also of the Lord. Drought, floods, volcanoes, earthquakes, tidal waves, fires, landslides. In the past, these have been called acts of God, and so they are. But again, can we fathom that God would bury thousands of people in a mudslide? Can we accept the fact that God would bury whole villages through the eruption of a giant volcano? Can we accept the fact that God, God would send drought by which thousands of people perish? Can a loving God do such a thing? Perhaps some of you recall the mudslide in the Philippines a number of years ago, triggered by heavy rains that buried a whole village. An elementary school packed with children was buried. The mudslide blocked roads, washed out bridges, and cut communications lines. Some 2,000 people may have drowned in thick, suffocating, inescapable muck. Would God bury 240 students in an elementary school under 30 feet of mud? Would he do that? Dear friends, we may not understand it, but the Bible declares that God is also sovereign over adversity. Our catechism is quite correct when it says in Lord's Day 10 that not only rain, fruitful years, food, health, and prosperity are from God, but also drought, lean years, sickness, and poverty, all things in fact come to us not by chance but from His fatherly hand. Listen to the words of Lamentations 3 verses 37 and 38. Who can speak? And have it happened if the Lord has not decreed it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? Many people find it extremely difficult to accept that both calamities and good things come from God. But for the Christian, God's sovereignty over both good and calamity is a source of great comfort. 
Charles Haddon Spurgeon once said this, There is no attribute more comforting to his children than that of God's sovereignty. Under the most adverse circumstances, in the most severe trials, they believe that God, that sovereignty has ordained their afflictions, that sovereignty overrules them, and that sovereignty will sanctify them all. There is nothing for which the children ought more earnestly to contend than the doctrine of the kingship of God over all the works of his own hands, the throne of God, and his right to sit upon that throne, end quote. Instead of being offended by the Bible's assertion that God is sovereign over both good and calamity, we should be comforted by it. Whatever our calamity or adversity may be, we may be sure that God has a purpose for it. Even that flat tire on your car, the stone that flew into the windshield, the leak in your living room roof, the tree that fell against your house, the sore throat and runny nose that you're struggling with, or the removal of your wisdom teeth. Does God have a purpose for it? Yes, He does. Yes, He does. For the redeemed, we may know that God in His providence is for us and not against us. He knows what He's doing with the pain in our lives. Therefore, when the Apostle Paul contemplated God's sovereignty, he could only praise the Lord, saying, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out, Romans eleven thirty three. We ought to acknowledge what Paul acknowledged, that God's ways are often beyond our ability to fathom. And we must simply learn to trust Him even when we can't make sense of it all. Verse 6 says, Whatever the Lord pleases, He does. These things may surpass human understanding. Nevertheless, as our Belgian Confession says, we are to adore the righteous judgments of God with the greatest humility and reverence. We are never to challenge his wisdom, love, or righteousness. Then fourthly, having seen his rule over nature, his rule over life, and his rule over adversity and calamity, we conclude with his rule over the nations. His rule over the nations. Go with me to verse 10. He defeated many nations and slew mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan. The psalmist acknowledged that the kingdoms of this world are all under the sovereign control of God. When Israel approached the land of Canaan, you recall how they defeated one nation after another, city after city, region after region, they all fell under the sword of Joshua. Was it the skill of Israel's armies? Was it the military genius of Joshua? Was it the might of the Israelite military machine? Certainly not. It was Israel's God overthrowing the nation so that his people could inherit the land. You see, brothers and sisters, all the nations are under his rule. What do we read in Daniel 2.20? Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He removes kings and raises up kings. Daniel 4.25 says, The Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Job 12, verse 23, He makes nations great and destroys them. He enlarges nations and guides them. One of the most frequent references to God's sovereignty in the Bible concerns His sovereignty over nations and governments. The Bible emphatically declares that all the decisions of rulers, kings, parliaments, and armies are under the authority of God and serve His will. When you click the news on the internet, 
and read the latest decisions of politicians, government officials, and Supreme Courts, you can be comforted by the fact that all those decisions, good or disappointing, are all under the control of our sovereign God. Legislative bodies and government officials in every nation are under His rule. Most government officials and legislative bodies are not intentionally carrying out the will of God. They're not aware of the fact that they're serving His purposes. In Luke chapter 2, when Caesar Augustus issued a decree that all the world should be registered, he was not aware that this would bring Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem where Jesus, our Savior, would be born. Caesar did not know that he was fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, yet that is precisely what he did. And when you read about Herod, Pontius Pilate, and the Jewish leaders who opposed Jesus, you discover that while they did not intend to be instruments in fulfilling prophecy, that is exactly what they were. They did what God planned for them to do. Congregation, sometimes we open our newspaper or click on the news and we groan, don't we? We groan over the foolish and ungodly decisions of politicians and world leaders. Or we read of wars, conflicts, and power struggles. When we read these things, we need to remember that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. He removes kings and sets them up. God appoints rulers and directs their decisions, which in no way, which is in no way an excuse for them to act foolishly or sinfully. He determines their military victories and losses. And even though they do not realize it and are often pursuing their own selfish ambitions, the rulers of nations are but servants of the great King and Lord of the universe, fulfilling His purposes. Congregation, God has revealed His sovereignty over the nations so that we might trust Him in the affairs of history as they unfold before us today. He can raise up the United States of America and make them a superpower, but He can also bring them down again. The great USA, with all the latest military equipment, stealth bombers, laser-guided missiles, state-of-the-art tanks, guns, and so forth, is it possible for them to fall? Babylon fell. Rome fell. Why not America? God can raise up Joe Biden, and he can bring him down again. He can raise up Vladimir Putin and bring him down again. He can raise up Hamas and he can grind them into the dust. When we understand God's government of the universe, it is a source of great comfort. This world is not out of control. God preserves and governs the universe and he directs all things to his intended goal. And one day, all the nations will be gathered before him. All the nations will stand before his throne. And God will say, did you heed my warnings? Did you listen to my admonishments? Did you repent under my discipline? And did you flee for refuge to the cross of Jesus You see, congregation, ultimately, stealth bombers and laser-guided missiles or whatever the latest may be will not deliver. All the nations must respond to God's word and turn to his way of salvation. God rules and guides the universe, and through all the calamities, wars, sickness, and death, he reminds us of the greater judgment to come. When we observe war and hear of earthquakes, we should ask, am I prepared to stand before the throne of God? 
When we see floods, mass killings, drought, or crop failure, we should ask, am I prepared to stand before His judgment seat? We can only be prepared through faith in Jesus. Therefore, congregation, let us all find refuge in Him. Find shelter at the cross, at Calvary, in the blood of the Lamb. Turn to Him. Turn to Him who alone is life eternal. For those who trust Him, the day is coming when there will be no more wars, no more earthquakes, floods, mass killings, drought, or cruel dictators. In the new creation, all will be restored to perfection. But the blessings of the new creation, the blessings of the new creation will only be enjoyed by those who trust in Christ and put their hope in their sovereign Lord. He rules over nature. He rules over life, he rules over adversity, he rules over the nation, and he is sovereign in salvation. Who's in charge? Behold your God. Confess his sovereignty and yield to his authority your king, your Lord, your master, your savior. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Lord, as we ponder who you are, We are truly humbled because we see so dimly and there is so much that we don't understand. But what you have revealed concerning your sovereignty is a tremendous comfort. And may each one of us, Lord, find refuge in you. May we not fear what is unfolding in our world. May we not fear the future, but may we commit ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren into the hands of our loving and sovereign God. Lord, we desire to yield to you, to know that you are at work even when we feel excruciating pain. We want to be able to lay ourselves down before you. We want to be able, as the apostle, to stand in awe of you. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. As we sing these concluding songs, Lord, may we do so with reverence before you. And may we do so with gratitude, resting in who you are. What you have accomplished in the history of this world, what you will, are yet to accomplish, and looking forward to the day of the new creation when all conflict will cease, when all pain will be gone. Lord, may each and every one of us here rest in Christ. We know it's only through him that we can enter the presence of your glory, to bask in your radiance without being utterly consumed. And so may our hope be in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.